Welcome to Pecan Baptist Church. Our vision and purpose is to love God, love others, introduce people to Jesus Christ, and watch them grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, helping them as they lead their friends and family to Christ. We pray that this message will bring you into a closer relationship with God and help you as you live the life He has given to you. Happy New Year. Doesn't seem like this is the first Sunday in the new year, but it is. So Happy New Year to you, and I'm, I'm praying that 2024 is a great year for, for this body and for your families, and um, God is just awesome. We're going to be starting a series on Jonah, and we... I did a series on Jonah about, well, it was about seven, yeah, seven and a half years ago. And so how many, uh, let's see, how many of you were here, seven, well, not here, in the Strip Center seven and a half years ago? Yeah, you're a minority, okay? <laughs> of the ones that raised their hands, how many of you can remember back seven years ago? <laughs> oh, come on. Well, this is a wonderful, wonderful story, and it fascinates me also how many people, even people claiming to be Christians, and maybe, and probably some of them are, that don't believe the story of Jonah really took place. And I think of all the stories in the Bible, probably Jonah and Noah's Ark are probably the two most unbelieved. Now, do you believe that this really happened? Oh, I do, 100%. He was swallowed up. Now, the Bible doesn't say it's a whale. It says it's a, a great sea monster or something like that is the actual interpretation. It could have been a whale. It could have been something else. But I believe it really happened just as the Bible said it did. Now, Jonah was a real person, and I want to show you that he is mentioned in Second Kings as being a prophet during the time, well, we'll just read it. Now, you may notice that there's not scriptures up on the wall, and so you're going to have to listen better because the computer's broke. So we're hoping to have it fixed by 2025. So... I'll just go ahead and start in uh, 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 23, yes. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he bade Israel sin. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of gath -hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which was very bitter, and there was neither bond nor free, nor was there any helper for Israel. And so what this is talking about here is Jonah was a prophet for the northern kingdom. The kingdom had already been split. Judah was the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was, and the north, northern kingdom was so often called, you may have heard it called Samaria, or you heard Israel, but the northern kingdom. So the northern kingdom had prophets, and Jonah was one of those prophets. He was probably a contemporary of, of uh, Hosea, probably of Amos, and so he, those were prophets of the northern kingdom. And then in the southern kingdom, you had other prophets and another king because the, the kingdom was divided, and that happened as a result of sin. The sin of the king, sin of Solomon, sin of David was the kingdom divided. And so after Solomon, that took place. So now here we have this interesting setup where Jonah is a prophet to the northern kingdom, and he is going to be given the task of going to Nineveh. Well, Nineveh is a, a Gentile. It's a Gentile city in a kingdom of Assyria. And we'll probably see also in this, you will see also that Jonah does not want to go. In fact, he hates the Ninevites. He hates them with a passion. That's my opinion. It doesn't really say why he hates them so much with a passion, but I believe that he is a prophet. He probably got word because, see, after his reign as a prophet, shortly thereafter, after King Jeroboam died about 15 years later, then the Assyrians came and conquered the northern kingdom. So he probably knew that was going to happen. Or perhaps he, uh, Hosea himself prophesied that, that's in Hosea chapter 9, first three verses. So maybe he knew of Hosea's prophecy that Syria, I mean, Assyria was coming to conquer the northern kingdom. Perhaps that's why he hated them with a passion. And so, you know, he's often referred to as the reluctant prophet. And uh, reluctant is probably a little light. He was probably more like a rebellious prophet. And so we'll be looking into that. Now, I think in this study, I think you'll see that 
We at, at times have a lot in common with Jonah. We'll get to see how God works with Jonah and other people around him and the things that God does, which I still think he does today, the way he works through situations. So I think we'll get to see a little of ourselves in this study. We'll also get to see that we are not the main characters of the story. You know, oftentimes, if we're teaching the story to kids, we, the main character we might think of as Jonah or maybe the whale or maybe the Ninevites, but the main, story, the main theme of the story is the redemption of man by God. That is still the main story. And so now, you know in the Bible itself, that's the theme of the whole Bible from cover to cover is the redemption of man carried out by God. That is the story and the theme of the Bible. And so it is also the theme of this book in Jonah. So now I want to turn now to Matthew chapter 12. Maybe, I don't want to criticize you too hard, maybe you're one of those Christians before today that didn't really believe that this was a real... Matthew chapter 12. I forgot to put that paper clip in. All right, Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38. This is Jesus speaking here. Well, it starts off with just narrating. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, Jesus talking here, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given. Now, why does he want to give a sign? Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And they're living in a time where he has done countless miracles. So many miracles, John said, there's not enough books in the world to contain everything that he did. And so he's done many, many signs, and they refuse to believe. It's just the same way with the story of Jonah. You can choose to believe it, or you can choose not to. Just like you can choose to believe in the resurrection and your salvation, or you can choose not to. People, people believe. They make decisions to believe or not. So now here is, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. <clears throat> now look at this, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <clears throat> now look at this. Does it sound like Jesus is saying Jonah was a real person? Does it sound like Jesus here is saying this really happened? He was three days and three nights in the sea monster like I'm going to be in the earth. So Jesus is declaring it to be absolutely true and as a historical event. Now look at, we'll continue. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, even though he was reluctant. <laughs> they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now who is he talking about? Himself the Lord Jesus. And why is he greater than Jonah? Because he's so much more than a prophet. He's not just a prophet. He is the risen son of God, the only begotten. And so yes, something greater than Jonah is here because Jonah needed salvation by Jesus Christ, right? Jonah is something far greater is here than Jonah himself. Well, and probably you consider there were a lot greater prophets than Jonah in, that existed and even in his time as a contemporary. But it's interesting to me why <clears throat> Jesus compared himself to Jonah. Have you, have you thought of that? He said, I'll give you no other sign but Jonah. Jonah and three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster. <clears throat> well, Jesus also, I think it also is partly because he really does <clears throat> associate himself. You know, he is truly man. He associates himself with sinners. But he is not a sinner. So my allergies are a little flared up, but we'll get through it. <clears throat> so now I want to point out to you again, Jonah is not the main character of the story, and you are not the main character of your story. Have you ever thought of that? And what is the purpose or the theme of your life? Well, ideally, I think you will, if you don't realize it now, you will at some point, the theme of your life is the redemption of man carried out by God. So your life this book, the whole Bible, the theme and everything is the same. But sometimes we don't look like it. Sometimes we look like the rebellious prophet running in the wrong direction. Thank you. <clears throat> I should have been teaching on living water today. All right. 
<clears throat> so now where was I? Oh, it's interesting that he compared himself. But see, they had a lot of things in common, and we'll get to that. Now we're finally going to turn to the book of Jonah. Now if you want to find Jonah, <laughs> this is one of those books, sometimes you have to go to the table of contents. So now, in the first verse, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So I wondered about this. The word of the Lord came up to Jonah. <clears throat> How did he receive the word? It really doesn't say or give any details. <clears throat> the water is supposed to help. Sorry about that. So the word of the Lord came to him. You know, and do you think that God speaks to people these days too? Oh, yeah, and it's not through just a prophet, right? There's not Old Testament prophets anymore. He speaks to every believer. Now, how does he do that? I was just contemplating all the different ways of looking in the Bible. You know, there's the still, small voice. There's an audible voice out of the burning bush. There's the sky or the stars, right, the wise men. There's the Bible, the Word of God, obviously, and prayer. It can be a preacher or a friend also speaking something to you. <laughs> I'm thinking of in Daniel, the hand writing on the wall. What about a storm? Angels have given messages, dreams, even animals, right? Balaam's donkey riding in the dirt, fire from heaven, a storm, blessings, a nudge, a push, a smack, pain, all of those things, right? God can communicate with us, and I believe he communicates with every person different. You know, and oftentimes, as a Christian or, or even as a preacher, we make the assumption that the way God deals with us is the way he's going to deal with everybody. But everybody is unique, and who knows you better than God, and who knows me better than God? We are all unique and made in a different way, and I believe he carries out communication with you and desires to in unique ways. And I don't have, I'm not in a position to tell you that that is wrong. So God wants to communicate with us. You know, he wants a relationship with us, and it requires two-way communication. And I'm not saying that's easy. Like I've said before, I've only heard, had a thought placed directly in my mind by God one time. And when that happened, it wasn't really a good news for me, right? It was a matter of correction. But most of the other time, it's just being led by the Spirit, staying connected to God. And you see coincidences take place, and things happen. Uh, today, Greg Reference Jonah in Sunday school, and we didn't plan that out. That ha stuff like that happens all the time. It's being led by the Spirit. So now, continuing with this, I want, for 2024, I want us to be in a better connection with the Lord this year than we were last year. And what that means is each and every one of us has to be, make a more dedicated effort to be connected to the Lord this year. And so if we do that, 2020, 2024 will be a success no matter what. So now, looking at this, how could Christ compare himself to Jonah? Well, interestingly, they were both born in Galilee. His own nation rejects the message of God that he has, but he's sent to the Gentiles. We'll come back to those two. They both slept on a boat in a storm. The sailors try to save them, save the boat, and then call on God, both circumstances, Jesus and, and Jonah. The sailors believe because of him. Three days and three nights, then alive. People believe because of the sign. And both, the three days and three nights, were the result of man's sin. In Jonah's case, it was his sin and the sin of the Ninevites. Bless you. And in Christ's case, it was a result of our sin, that he was three, night, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So now, this, we, you can see that this book is a picture of, it is symbol, symbolic, and Jonah probably had no idea how symbolic his life and these turn of events would be in picturing of the Messiah and the work of the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to go to John chapter 7 because I told you they were both born in Galilee, and I think this is interesting. John 7, starting in verse 40. <clears throat> Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? <laughs> Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem? 
Remember that incredible series of events that we looked at at Christmas of how God had to make all of these things come true, and it seemed impossible. He's supposed to be from Bethlehem, born in Bethlehem, right? And then he's, he's a Nazarene. He's from Nazareth. He's from Galilee. How is all of these things going to take place? He will call his son out of Egypt, another prophecy. So he's from Egypt. How are all of these, and God lined all these things up? And you know, Mary and Joseph, their lives were like a whirlwind the first few years for sure. And then I wonder if they had the opportunity to ever see these scriptures and how it all came about. And the same with Jonah. He probably looks back at this now because he's in heaven and can see, wow, I did not know all those bad things that happened, being swallowed by a fish, were gonna, was such a beautiful picture of the Messiah in the work of his first coming. He couldn't see it. So guys, I promise you this. Do you think we don't see it either? Remember, the theme of our life is the redemption of man, ours and other people's around us, the redemption of man by God. Do you think we see more clearly than Jonah did the symbolism that's carried out in his life? I don't think so. So take courage from that, understanding, because you can't see the forest for the trees. Know this, God is working in your life. God is carrying out his will in your life. And our goal is to not be the rebellious prophet. Our goal is to be more like Christ, right? Even though sometimes we are. But understand that God is working in our lives. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David, from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which, what, which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said, of, said to them, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? That is correct. They answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Well, I think that's interesting now because here is Jonah from Galilee. And remember, there the other similarities here between Jonah and Christ is that Christ was sent to his own nation, who as a nation rejected him. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't Jews that believe there were many jews that believed, but as a nation they rejected them and so then he goes to the gentiles and they receive it now this was prophesied long ago in isaiah and other places as well so i want to turn now to isaiah chapter 55 some of you may be thinking does he have to turn to isaiah every week almost <clears throat> and there was a couple verses that i'm really focusing on but I just kept getting wider and wider. So we're going to look at the first nine verses. This, again, is a prophecy about, about the Lord Jesus. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Now, how many times did Jesus talk about living water, right? Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come by and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money? For what is not bread? Remember the time he told the disciples, I have food to eat that you know not of. And they're like, did somebody bring him something? Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Can you say an amen to that? I mean, in the materialistic world in which we live, you know, wealth. Have you ever seen, you, of course you have, the rich person that gives everything you always dreamed of and they accomplish all their goals and then they shoot themselves or kill themselves. Have you ever thought about that? Why? Because they realize that materialism and greed is a monster that can never get enough. Contentment is the way to peace. Your wages does not satisfy. Listen careful to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And you've probably heard this verse before. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And thinking of that as we will continue in the study of Jonah, thinking of the strange way that God worked through all this situation with storms and a a sea monster. We may just call it a whale because it's easier, but it may not have been a whale, right? But at the same time, look how God worked in this mysterious ways to bring about this situation in Jonah's life and the life of the Ninevites, which they had no idea what was going on. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So now, one thing that just rings out, and you've heard me say this before, but to me it is just so amazing that before the Christ came and died for us, that just by pure grace we could be saved. Who could have ever imagined what he was going to do? I mean, could you imagine any man coming up with a plan such as this? God, why don't you come, give the only begotten, and come, be a man as the Son of God, and then let us kill you, and then that death will serve as our forgiveness and pardon forever. Could you imagine such a thing? Now think of the verse again. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Absolutely. And so again, in our own lives, with God carrying out things in our own lives, is it even possible that we can see the smallest iota of what he's really doing and we don't understand? Of course not. We just have to trust him and keep trusting him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And you know what? I'm thankful for that. Aren't you? Because if God would have had me come up with a plan for salvation, it wouldn't have been as glorious as free grace, the blood of Jesus. Amazing what God has done. His ways indeed are higher. Now, he was given the task to arise and go to the great city and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, Jonah doesn't have an interest in their repentance. He wants judgment. Even after he's corrected by the the whale, right, and sent back there, and then he goes reluctantly still, he still wants to see justice. Well, a person like Jonah, I don't think, really understands relative righteousness, and that's where I'm going next because I don't think a lot of people... People on the earth, even Christians, understand relative righteousness. And what I'm talking about is not a single person deserves forgiveness. God made it that way. But yet, at the same time, if you flip the script, some people have a problem with a person on death row who did horrible things accepting Christ before he goes to the chair. Some people have a problem with that. He receives the free gift of grace. If you have a problem with that, then you don't understand relative righteousness. And basically, we're going to turn to Romans now and look at it. But basically, what that means is, compared to Christ, our righteousness is nothing. Even the best of us, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so, when you compare it, if you look at Christ's righteousness as infinity, right, if Christ's righteousness is infinity, which it is because he's holy and perfect, perfection, Compare infinity to any other number, and it's essentially zero. That's why any number divided by infinity is essentially zero. And so that's relative righteousness. Even though, yes, some of us have lived a lot more moral lives than some other people, we still don't deserve the infinite pardon of Jesus Christ because it required infinite righteousness. So now in Romans... Paul is talking about this very thing because there are people who are trying to be justified by living out the law. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they, meaning Jews or Gentiles, right? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands There is no one who seeks for God. Now, you hear what that's saying? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Comparatively, you know what? There is not a person who's ever lived 
that has sought God the way he should be sought. There's not, except for the Lord Jesus. That's the truth. So no one has sought God the way he should be sought. No one understands. Remember, his ways are higher. No one truly understands what God is doing. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. Now thinking of Jonah, right? He was given the go, go to the great city of Nineveh. Why is he going? Well, God has lined up events in Nineveh in a time is right for their repentance. And so he calls Jonah to go, but Jonah doesn't go. Look at this. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is no one who does good. Now, Paul is saying this, right? It's hard to think of a person more devoted to God, more willing to go. And as Greg said in the Sunday school class, they both from the same point at Troas, one of them is given the task to go, and he goes, and the other one goes the opposite way. But Paul is certainly devoted, but Paul is saying these words. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Now he's quoting from the Old Testament here. Look at their throat is an open grave, and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that's talking about us too. Even though we are the righteousness of Christ and we have the forgiveness of Christ, we are more like Jonah than even we are Paul because sometimes we don't go. You know, there is a sin of not doing also. Sometimes we do not say. Sometimes we do not do what we are supposed to do. Now look at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So there again, there is nothing. Remember, this is a comparison of who we really are without God. And there is nothing we can do. We, there is nothing we can do that earns our way there. And when you understand that, then you understand relative righteousness because God is just amazing. See, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Jesus fulfilled all the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. And remember, I told you this before. There is only two types of people on earth. There is the believer and the unbeliever. That's the only division that there should be. And the division and the goal of the believer is to get the unbelievers to believe. That's our purpose. That is the theme of our lives. It's the theme of the Bible. It's the theme of Jonah, and it's the theme of our lives. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whom, I'm going to continue on. That's just so good. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So again, you know, maybe that's you. Maybe you've struggled with that, and you don't truly understand grace. Well, we have to understand who we are in order to understand God's grace fully and his righteousness. And grace is such a hard thing to understand for us because we live in a world of consequences. You know, if you do something bad, you get caught, and there's a consequence. We live in a, and we also have this idea that goes along with it. If we do something good, then something good should come about, right? You sow what you reap. But at the same time, grace is not like that. Grace is not like that at all. It is truly just a free gift. And the person who accepts Christ the day before his execution on death row is just as saved as any of us here because Christ's righteousness is infinite. And basically, on our own righteousness without Christ, we're all a bunch of zeros. And everybody's a zero. And that's the truth. But with Christ... We have the righteousness of Christ, and we're no longer zeros. 
We have infinite righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ because our sins have been forgiven by our faith in Jesus Christ by his shed blood. So now, in Jonah, you don't have to turn there. It said, arise and go. And the question is, for each and every one of us today, you know, God has called us as the body of Christ in the Great Commission to carry out and to spread the gospel. Because remember, what is the theme? What is the theme of our lives? What is the theme of this body, right? We are to arise and go, however that is. And we work together as a team to accomplish the Great Commission. Foreign, local, whatever, however the Lord leads us to do it. And I'm still praying, and I'm praying that the, the opportunity will come about starting a bus ministry, and we can see many salvations as a result of that. Maybe more like a van ministry, not a bus ministry. But he's given the task of arise and go. We're given the same task. Arise and go. No, really, arise and no. <laughs> arise and go. So the question is, how are we going to respond to that? You know, I hope we respond more like the Apostle Paul, are most certainly more like the Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross willingly to die for you and me and not respond like Jonah, the rebellious prophet who went the opposite way. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries of Pecan Baptist Church, go to our website at www.pecan.church or call 682 682- 205-1565. We're located in Granbury, Texas. Services are each Sunday at 10 a.m.